some thought uh, on the laws and the regulations needed for the social implementation of AI. One, number one, transparency and uh, accountability. Second, even if AI is programmed by humans, it can make autonomous judgments based on uh, algorithm and data. Data. Therefore, it is necessary to make the de uh, decisions and uh, re reasoning of AI transpar transparent. Uh, if AI makes a mistake, it is important to clarify who is responsible for it. Number three, protection of privacy. Number four, AI may collect and use personal information, so laws such as the uh, Personal Information Protection Act and the Data Protection Act uh, will be necessary. It is also important to clear, clearly state the purpose of collecting personal information and uh, obtain the individual's uh, content. Five, elimination of bias and uh, discrimination. Six, AI can have uh, bias, biases and uh, discriminatory thinking like humans. Therefore, rules are needed to prevent uh, based or discriminatory discussion making by AI. Seven, ensuring safety. Eight, if AI makes important decisions, it is important to ensure that the discussion are safe. For example, if an autonomous vehicle uh, causes an accident, it is necessary to clarify who is responsible. Number nine, uh, consideration of social impact. Number 10, rules, and need, rules are needed to minimize the impact of AI, so, AI on society. For example, if jobs are automo automated by AI, uh, policies will be needed to support people affected by the uh, automation. In, in summary, uh, laws and regulations are necessary uh, for the social implementation of AI, including transparency and uh, accountability, protection of privacy, elimination of bias and discrimination, ensuring safety and uh, consideration of social impact. Uh, these regulations will make the social implementation of AI safer and more uh, sustainable. Uh, yesterday, Japan's Prime Minister uh, Fumio Kishida visited Kyiv. Ukraine and held, held talks with President Zelensky. Uh, it is also planned for the, for the year, year's G7 summit to be held in Hiroshima, Japan, which is the birthplace of Prime Minister Kishida. Uh, in this sense, I believe that the Prime Minister's commitment to nuclear disarmament is among the highest of any politicians in the world. As a personal dream of mine, I'd like to attract the United Nations Asia Pacific headquarters to Japan. Uh, New York has the United Nations headquarters, and Geneva in Switzerland has the United Nations European office. Uh, despite the uh, presence of uh, popular, popular countries, uh, such as India and China in Asia, uh, there is no place for everyone to gather and discuss together as the United Nations. I feel that Hiroshima, as the first city to suffer an atomic bombing, uh, is the most uh, suitable city and the location to attract the United Nations Asia Pacific headquarters due to its historical significance. Uh, in Japanese, AI can also mean lab. Therefore, it is important for the social implementation of AI to make AI understand, appreciate lab. Lastly, I believe that when a uh, malevolent AI or an AI that at and and Antagonized, antagonized humanity uh, emerges in this world. The only ones capable of fighting against it, are, it would be uh, benevolent AI and God. Uh, I am very much looking forward to meeting you all in Japan in April. So thank you very much for listening. Arigatou gozaimashita.
Thank you. I love you all. Thank you so much, uh, Lasuya. Uh, uh, aligato, aligato. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so I think uh, now, um, yeah. Nasli Chukri, please. Yeah. Hello, Nasli, you are here? Okay. Zlatko, Zlatko. Yeah. Now, wait a second. What are we doing? Uh, okay, okay. Nasli, now, Nasli is there. Okay. Nasli is there. No, Zlatko, go ahead. Please. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I can see you. Oh, yeah, please. Now. Yeah. Still late. Still late. Yeah, okay. Okay, okay, okay. okay. I will be brief. Um, you know, these are rather dangerous times, we agree, uh, but they're also, uh, we're talking about very serious matters. I'm not telling you anything that you don't know. So if we look at the policy side, just for a moment, the checklist. Suppose, assuming we have policy, miracle, we have policy, we have to think about uh, implementation and it's not too early to, to learn from previous experiences uh, and to learn from current practices. Uh, and I'm not suggesting we should uh, address implementation before policy, but I do suggest that we turn to records that we ourselves, uh, that individual societies have, have created um, as assets that we can use. And then we have the issue of enforcement. Very hard. Uh, the, the usual putting people in prison is, is a little bit difficult, although we have seen algorithms being kind of um, not put in prison, but uh, separated, segregated. And then finally, we have the matter of accountability, which is likely to be far more complex that we think it is. Now, I don't mean to start with just negativity, negativity. It's just a question of structuring the pathways that we have to, to go through. Uh, and please consider these remarks as building on um, the, the previous speakers, more at the implementation uh, uh, level. There are some, some dilemmas that we really have to address, at least maybe not all of us, but certainly some of us. Um, having to do with the, with the contrast or the stress between social time and system time. Uh, we, we operate generally on uh, show up at 8.30 because we're starting at 8.30. We have a major disconnect recognizing and adjusting to uh, what I would call near instantaneity. I'm not telling you anything that you don't know, uh, but for policy purposes and for pragmatics as well, uh, we're really dealing with complexities in, in uh, space-time systems. Um, we can't establish policies that change at computational time or instantaneity. Not a good idea. Uh, we want policies that induce, induce stability. So in fact, what we're looking for are interfaces, policy instruments, processes, interfaces between what we call policy and what our objectives are as the previous speakers have, have, have noted, uh, it for a world and in a world and in, re in an alternative reality that operates near instantaneously. Um, much of what we think about now comes out of the social system uh, and values that we believe in as a previous speaker indicated. Uh, what we're not very good at is the other way around, starting with the, the structures of systems, structures of, of properties of systems that create challenges as well as, as dilemmas and work backwards to uh, the policy, policy structures and policy responses. Uh, imposing our own structures on those systems may make it uh, a, 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 little, a little difficult. The, the good news is that there seems to be a general agreement about core principles. Uh, nobody would stand up and say in public, I'm against transparency. I'm against ethics. Um, uh, I don't believe in accountability. I mean, that, that set of uh, issues, I think we can really um, take as, as more or less as assumptions. But the, but the 
the the dilemma is transformation to um, some form of implementation and some form of accountability. So it's not so much the recognition that's our dilemma, but the transformation into reality. If you were to ask me, what are the two major challenges be before us now as we think this out, one I've already mentioned, which is a space time dilemma. We operate in different systems at different space times. Uh, along with the fact that these operations cross borders very quickly, jurisdictional issues come up here. Um, who's accountable, who's enforcement, etc. cetera. Uh, but the other issue that has always been very problematic, at least for some of us, for some of us that try to get some clarification uh, of uh, the, the, the four pieces of policy, the policy, the implementation, et cetera, et cetera, that I started with, it has to do with the accountability. Uh, I firmly believe in accountability as a principle. I absolutely do. Um, and the reciprocity of accountability. But even in the large systems we now have that are university system, corporate systems, etc., cetera, it, it's not that easy uh, to pinpoint the accountability to an individuals. And I'm not quite sure whether we even want to go to the individuals as opposed to the, the decision system. Um, when we talk about complex uh, forms of, of, of uh, computation or AI, et cetera, that's a dilemma. I, I'm not pos posing it as a terminal problem, but I'm posing it as the need to really flush out uh, well, given we accept account accountability and we think this is important, what are the models that would what would make it um, more operational than just uh, a, 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 core, a, a core principle? The, the uh, so these are these are my my major two. But then when we think about where are we going mm -hmm. from from here, uh, I've learned from from the previous speakers several important uh, milestones that we go from here um, that, that are almost inevitable. The question is, how do we steer through them? Uh, one of them, it, the first is uh, the, the uh, recognizing that geopolitical strategic realities are important. Uh, and because all forms of AI intersect with all forms of geopolitical and strategic issues, this is just in that respect, we just have to recognize that we're going to have to carry this along. The, the second thing I've learned today, which is really quite important, I knew it, but I didn't absorb it, let's say, is the, the um, uh, which was our first speaker today, um, which is using, drawing on, adapting, operationally the, the 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 mechanisms that we've developed for policy uh, recognizing the time space uh, disconnect um, and we don't want laws to alter as quickly as uh, computational time crossing borders etc um, but we don't want a lag either um, so the, the 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 graduate student task is to unbundle the mechanisms we've developed and just highlight those are, that are really, really important to us as a transition to, um, to the frameworks that, we, that we're talking about. And the third and final thing that I would like to stress, although that too, I did know, I did indeed know, but I think Tuan is, is, is really, is to be appreciated and recognized for uh, forcing us or encouraging us to address this which is to recognize diversity and to represent and to pull together a very very uh, diverse community to, to address those issues um and this sounds like uh, motherhood and apple pie don't take it that way take it as a very effective strategic move to make us move towards uh, the policy framing that we're looking for et voila that's all i have to say thank you Thank you so much, Nasli. Uh, Zlatko, now, yeah, please. Well, thank you, Tuan. I, I, I always enjoy our gatherings. I mean, every time, uh, you would be surprised how many notes 
I'm putting myself on my own in a little <laughs> sheet of paper then in my little Moleskino, which is serious for Moleskinos. And I mean, every time when I get, uh, you know, prepared, ready for this meeting, I try to prepare myself uh, so I don't look like someone who is brainstorming in front of you with himself. And, uh, and of course, I prepare some notes, but I'll have to reflect on what I heard because every speaker really made me think additionally uh, about the things that I want to reflect on, having in mind what I was thinking anyway. I think that uh, I'll, I'll start backwards, I mean, from the last speaker, because Nasli actually underlined geopolitics and strategic importance of what we are talking about. And I think that uh, Minister Nakayama was also basically speaking, talking with different words, having his precise Japanese, like Germans do in Europe, that Japanese do in, in the Pacific part of the world, as you give precise puncto one, puncto ten. And, but I also, you were also, Minister was talking, basically speaking about this uh, increasing need for cooperation, having in mind, basically speaking, what also Nazi was underlining this general. Uh, at the same time, uh, when Thomas started, he starts with, 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 with we. And I think it is important to connect who we are. We want to be we as a planet, as the, this artificial intelligence is over sizing every nation, every region, every company, every individual. So, of course, it's hardware to go to have a world as being we. But having said so, I think it is important that we try to do in some kind of, let's say, concentric circles before we come to the big global circle, we as a world. I think we have to see how we can put together different we's, European Union, uh, United States, Japan, or liberal democracies, how we can create something that we look, look as we at least us, who are liberal democracies, that we do together. Why I'm saying this? For example, in Europe, there is big, big, for almost second year in a row, there's big debate and the things are very going very far away with something which is regulatory fr framework for artificial intelligence on the level of EU. And it was launched back in the beginning of uh, 2021 with an idea to be ready by the end of 22. The way it looks like, it will be ready by the end of this year. Uh, we will have adopted very, 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 uh, you know, uh, extensive, detailed uh, regulatory framework that, of course, will apply to European Union. But I mean, at the same time, it has global impact because it will be applicable to everyone who is dealing with the European Union in every aspect of that meaning, which means that basically speaking, it will affect everyone. A few days ago, I had a very interesting uh, thing that popped up on my screen. Uh, there is uh, on 8 January, January 27th, European Union, United States of America strengthened cooperation research in artificial intelligence and computing for the public good, which was very encouraging title. Uh, actually, they signed in virtual session from White House and Director for, uh, for Connectivity, European Connectivity, Administrative Arrangement of Artificial Intelligence for Public Good. So the things are happening in bits and pieces around. And everything goes, I think, in a context of what we called, and we have said the Global Alliance for Digital Governance. I was advocating, and I think that we should use this opportunity, especially when we are trying to pin down the framework that we want to, to let's say, uh, go further with for um, regulation of uh, artificial intelligence and GPTs and things like that. I think it is very important that we uh, create some kind of sense of urgency for this, because that's what we can do. Sense of urgency with our connections, sense of urgency and some kind of, uh, let's say, awareness, big awareness that we have to do something. I think that uh, Cameron was talking about, uh, about the speed, how the things are going fast. And I think it is very important because obviously while we are discussing about regulatory framework, especially uh, when we start talking about how to build up institutions that will be institutions of, let's call it uh, liberal democracies, or what we call it a global alliance for digital governance. And if we want to extend that on a level of United Nations and the globe, it will require time. At the same time, technology is not waiting for us to see how we can deal with regulatory framework. So I think it is very important that we do speed up what we do. And we speed up awareness of what we are talking about and we speed up at least some concrete principles to pin them down and offer them 
in a broader broader space. I'll just and I'll come uh, because Cameron was talking about. I mean, yesterday you rightly put everyone was talking about this GPT version four, and it is very interesting. I was listening to CEO of, of, of OpenAI, who is saying that uh, the big advantage of uh, GPT-4 from GPT-3 is when you ask GPT-3 uh, how do you make a bomb, then it will very clearly tell you how to make a bomb. But if you do GPT-4 as the same question, it won't tell you so well, because they realize that actually that can be uh, used in a ways that are very destructive. So I'm pointing out just two things. First one, I think what we should say, and I'm sure that here we have people who are much more qualified than me from Tom and Nasli and others, uh, who uh, that this thing without that being regulated has the biggest, biggest threat to what is called this misinformation. The mis disinformation, misinformation is going to explode if we do not do something wrong. That's one thing. A second thing, what Minister was talking about basically speaking the artificial intelligence and uh, this type of technologies being in a, a function of, uh, let's say, wars and conquering the non democracies, being conquering democracies, to be very precise. So, and I'll conclude with this. Um, I would say, I, I'm sure you probably know that something which struck me more is because we were talking about GPT 3 and GPT 4. But on March 9th, in Smithsonian, in Smithsonian uh, magazine, there was marvelous article talking probably, if some of you guys are more familiar with it, Osaka University, Yu Takaki and Shinji Nishimoto, two guys who were actually doing with artificial intelligence very much. They published something which I, I think it's even more, more opening, more questions than GPT-3 and GPT-4. What they did is they published the article in which uh, four people, like us, four of us, were given photos, photos, photos. It was given like photos, and they were looking at the photos, and they, they, the brain was scanned, and artificial intelligence supported technology actually reproduced the pictures of what was scanned in the memory in the brain of the individuals. And I don't want to be very, but for me, it is, and as I said, that AI model, it can draw what you are thinking with 80% accuracy. 80% accuracy. I'm giving you here, see this little, little teddy bear up there and see this plane up there? That's what those four people saw. And down there, you can see what was given by artificial intelligence scanning. So with IT, you see that these planes are not exactly how they were seen by individuals. This teddy bear is not exactly the same. I don't know why his bow tie is pink instead of a little bit darker. I have no clue. But what amazed me more is even the photo, which I was I like much more than this one. Here is the clock. Upper figure photo is the one that uh, what people saw. And down there, what scanned brain actually reproduce with artificial intelligence. Down there you have a, this uh, um, train, train from the beginning of 19th, 20th century. The only thing that is in train, the artificial intelligence recognized that this train has a lot of fog around. And that is basically because in every movie from Humphrey Bogart and Claire Gable and other guys, you see when the train leaves the station, there is a smoke from the train. So artificial intelligence probably concluded that people did not see well. There is no fog or there's no this steam from the train. What I'm trying to say is this is even area which is getting more, more need to be at least thinking about what do we do with it. I won't say regulate, but to see what do we do. So to make a long story short, let's call for alliance of like-minded liberal democracies, what we can do together to regulate something among us and then offer to the rest of the world. I'll stop in here. Yeah, thank you so much, Zlatko. Uh, now, uh, say I'm more some uh, Brandeis scholar and uh, see great contribution for framework. See, uh, prepare for that. And uh, now, some uh, Siam, uh, please uh, present. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Juan, and thank you, everybody. Um, it's very humbling to. Uh, 
hear all the perspectives uh, that I would say we all share. Um, and so rather than um, uh, going over um, anyone or each of them, uh, what I would like to say is um, uh, why, again, of course, I'll come back to why the work we are doing and why what needs to be done is crucial. And um, what um, I, 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 I would, when we were talking, uh, some of us, um, some of the earlier speakers uh, spoke about uh, misinformation, disinformation. I want to uh, uh, just add uh, something to that. Um, what has happened among other sources or among other reasons why it is happening is that the voices of moderation uh, are being drowned out, whether in, in, in democracies such as uh, the US or elsewhere, uh, in social media, by extreme voices, uh, extreme views, uh, agendas, um, in the public discourse. Um, across uh, the political spectrum, we um, observed, um, uh, and, and, and democracies are at, at uh, risk. Uh, we, uh, I, I was looking at live uh, feed from what was happening in France over the weekend about uh, the president having proposed to age, uh, to raise the retirement age and demonstrations and strikes and so, so on. And there was a, a word of no confidence um, against uh, Macron, um, President Macron. And uh, he uh, survived by a very slim margin of nine votes. Now, the reason I point this out is that where France could be moving is in the direction of Marie Le Pen, who is on the right side. And so there are these extremist um, uh, currents uh, in, in, in democracies such as France and pioneering democracies and in, in the U.S. that we are observing. And that is of great concern in the context of what the other point that came up about geopolitics and the dominant uh, uh, um, behavior of um, uh, governments such as China's um, and Russia's. Uh, what we um, what we are um, observing in um, in the in the Ukraine war is that it facilitated or or energized the U.S. and NATO allies to come together. Uh, and reduce the distance that had been that had occurred in in more recent history. Um, what um, what is encouraging here uh, in our work is that what is happening uh, in the in the AI uh, technology and the threats that it poses to our democracies because of um, the dominant dominant dominating behaviors and, and uh, of of and and other uh, uh, mal uh, uses of uh, technology by uh, governments such as Russia's or China's, um, it th that the threats have brought us together, and this is the moment when we do need with. In, in, in this, uh, in, through the Boston Global Forum's work, um, uh, we, we need to leverage, we should leverage um, uh, our coming together for developing a shared framework based on shared principles and, and, um, um, and some of the shared mechanisms um, in, in all the uh, uh, points that uh, um, Honorable Minister from Japan uh, laid out and everybody else um, uh, spoke to and uh, that we have been following. Um, I, I 
I personally cannot emphasize um, uh, more how AI, what Nancy um, was speaking to in uh, as like the uh, Prime Minister, um, is that AI and technology are developing at a much faster rate um, and, and uh, functioning at a faster rate than we can develop policy, implement policy, or policies that are um, equitable, responsible, and are all the principles that we espouse. Um, and so um, uh, I would say um, the, the saving um, the, I wouldn't say saving, but preserving rather the, the democratic alliances is imperative uh, for a number of reasons, um, but especially because of what AI and digital technology is capable of among everything else that happens in, in geopolitical um, uh, um, uh, 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 my, um, uh, landmines, uh, landmine, yeah, yes. Um, and um, the uh, last point I, I would um, add to everything that has been said um, is that um, uh, what we do as humans uh, is extremely important. We, we design as, as a, as, or humans, as, as whoever designs. We design, we are the creators, and we need to find ways to um, build in some safeguards, some guardrails in the design itself, so that um, we are not, as Nasli very well uh, said, um, that we, we are, not being controlled by, uh, I, I'm just paraphrasing very simply, we are not controlled by what we have created, but we are able to manage what we have created, the risks, the benefits, everything for, um, in an equitable, responsible, accountable manner. And I would say um, that uh, I, uh, I, we, it, it, they, there is time for action, um, collaborative action. And it, it, it would and should include uh, many, for the lack of a better word, stakeholders in, in all, all sectors uh, of uh, the democracies. Um, and I, I think we'll, we'll have a, a much lot um, will be uh, moving forward, uh, we, we will be deliberating and acting on, on uh, uh, the framework and how we are going to come together uh, or are coming together to, to act on this. So um, I, I, I'm a new entrant to the group and I don't want to take up more time. Uh, there's a lot of wisdom here um, and around us uh, and I, I look forward to working with everybody to to uh, to be uh, to be effective uh, for our work to be effective in good time because it's urgent. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Samo. And uh, now I think uh, David, please, uh, David, have to left uh, soon for class. So I think uh, to we priority for David. Uh, unmute, David, please. Not yet. Please unmute. Oh, maybe your your speaker have some problem. Uh, have some problem. <clears throat> so, uh, uh, please uh, call my phone. So I will turn on my phone for for your voice here. My cell phone six one seven six one seven two eight six six five eight nine. Hey. 
Yes, now <clears throat> people can hear you now. Okay. Uh, can other people hear me other than Tuan? Yes. Okay, I'm awfully sorry. I seem to have trouble each time with this Google Meet and my computer. <laughs> um, so I'm reluctant to speak much because I'm going to turn off my speaker because I'm hearing myself in a way that is difficult. Okay. incentive for the race for the development of next generation AI is uh, means that it, it's going to be imperative to have the sort of regulation and cultural norms that we're all talking about here because uh, and there are precedents for that but um, but we know that there are governments and people and groups that feel that they are not bound by those and don't share those values and we're going to be using them just the same in developing them uh, or stealing, you know, uh, technology, just, just the same. So, you know, who's vulnerable? It's really people and democracies. Uh, in terms of, you know, in, in terms of consequences, it's the issue of manipulation of the human mind brain that, you know, uh, as, uh, as, as my friend Zlatko said, and, uh, the minister, um, you know, he showed a very graphic example uh, perhaps at another time in, in this sort of forum, I can talk about brain computer interface and AI and all the, the sort of implications uh, thereof, which some of which are rather dystopian. And, and so we need to understand this. I, I think where we're seeing it play out already, even without AI, frankly, but on a large scale computer front with the human mind brain in groups and individuals is, um, is what, what, I would call sort of as a, as a neurologist or a brain scientist, afferent and efferent loops. The afferent loop is where you get information in. And so an authoritarian government or a company for that matter can gather, as we know, a tremendous amount of information about people, compute that in a way that uh, allows them to uh, very smartly manipulate people based upon exact individual and group profiles, which is the efferent part, the outgoing part. And that manipulation can be by uh, mis or disinformation. Uh, it can be by, um, by actual consequences. You know, someone's not going to be able to get a ticket to travel if they don't have certain beliefs uh, or support the party. Uh, someone is not going to be able to get um, life insurance and on and on. And, and so between this afferent and efferent loop, uh, you know, people can become rather helpless, um, when, especially when backed up by coerci coercion and use of force, which, uh, which <clears throat> these sorts of entities have no uh, difficulty and, and no compunction, you know, about, about using. So I think th these are really large concerns. Uh, the other, I, um, I think, is the financial implications. Uh, this will be it already is, but it's it's really going to be a revolution. And I was reading something just last night in the New York Times. Uh, Ezra Klein had an interview with um, 
with an expert on AI. Um, and it was rather lengthy, but uh, she gave the example of, um, uh, of weaving rugs and it used to all be done by hand. And all of a sudden you had a machine and while there are still people who want a handmade rug, um, you know, you can now get a very high quality rug made by machine and there's no turning back and, and almost all the rugs in the world are, are that. And so, um, people's jobs will be at stake. Um, and in that article, it talked about how anybody who does anything remotely, um, it, job, their job actually is going to be at stake. And we saw during COVID that it was the, uh, the garbage men and the store clerks and the truck drivers who were the heroes uh, and whose jobs couldn't be replaced. Although you could have robots for, for many of those things as, as is already happening. And so if, lot, if few people make lots of money off this or few entities or control it and more and more people lose their jobs, although there will be other jobs and, and, and things that will come into play and other types of employment, hopefully, but it's likely that the the inequity of, of wealth is going to get bigger at the same time as um, as people's uh, jobs getting uh, more curtailed. And so we all know what the, the consequences of those sorts of things can be historically. So I, I hate to paint a, a rather glum picture, um, but uh, I guess with all of my fellows on this call, uh, you know, just adding, therefore, support for uh, the sense of urgency that, that the minister was talking about and that uh, and that uh, and, and for whatever impact we can have. Um, and then really thinking, as you do quite beautifully, Juan, what impact we can have, because we are not big and we're not part of other sorts of entities. But I think you interact and have us interact with so many and um and so we want to try to leverage what impact we can have for good thank thank you so much um thank you so much uh, david uh great and uh now uh, uh, yeah uh i think um <clears throat> before i invite my dear friends two great people in uh AI and a very new ideas, new concept, AI human, as uh, John Klippinger and uh, Tom Keeler. And uh, I would like to say some what a few words. Thank you so much for your great presentation and uh, ideas, wonderful. And uh, we, this year, we celebrate 90th birthday of Governor Michael Dukakis, as I talked in the uh, last uh, city, uh, last, last uh, meeting on uh, February 28th, we will do more um, <clears throat> in Japan, in Tokyo, in uh, Boston Thai is uh, April 4. That is Shinjo Abe Initiative Conference in our city to support for Japan, the US, India, Europe to develop AI and uh, community in tech economy to compete with China and a uh, threat from China and Russia. So we are uh, uh, we have very important conference uh, April 5, Tokyo Thai, and uh, April 26 at Harvard Faculty Club in person uh, to do great thing. And in 90th birthday of Governor Michael Dukakis, now this year, we will uh, launch the uh, Global Enlightenment Community <coughs> that is uh, in great and um, with uh, great people and distinguished people from the war to just make our goals and our work happen in AI governance, digital governance and a new uh, concept in society. And we work and support for the United Nations Centennial Initiative and the United Nations and government of uh, four pillars, the US, Japan, India and uh, Europe. And we expand to South Korea, Australia, Canada, and Israel. For we make <coughs> that is this community, global enlightenment community, we call is the global enlightenment leaders. Uh, as uh, uh, president of European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, uh, president of Finland, uh, Sauli Niinisto, and uh, speaker of Sweden, uh, Andris Nolan. 
<coughs> and many great uh, scholars and distinguished contributors for the book, Remaking the World to Worst and Edge Global Enlightenment. The book we <coughs> collaboration, uh, collaborate between Boston Global Forum and the United Nations published 2021. And uh, also here, we have some great uh, figure uh, here as uh, Zasuheda Nakayama. He contributed uh, for that book and also Zlatko Lagumziza. And uh, also we have great leaders contribute for uh, this mission as the uh, former Prime Minister Israel uh, Ehud Barak and uh, also uh, uh, Kem Kerry, yeah, great leader, uh, former leader and now also high impact to do. This is our community. We connect with uh, before government action do, we do, our community at leading with thinkers, scholars, innovators, business leaders. And <clears throat> yes, we will deliver letter of Governor Michael Dukakis and Boston Global Forum about that. And we hope we will approach and do very much. And uh, we have special initiative and support for Japan in uh, Shinzo Abe Initiative Conference in Tokyo in early uh, April, April 5th. Yeah, so I would like to inform you great thing. And our new ideas, new concept will approach and very fast and very uh, uh, directly to uh, policy makers, decision makers. And also we <coughs> engage and connect with our brands in Harvard, MIT from centers and labs and with new concept, new ideas and with, think with leaders and thinkers here. And another university as Silicon Valley, uh, Stanford, Berkeley and UK, something like that. And uh, yes, we think we have a great uh, new model of Silicon Valley and we name the Global Enlightenment Mountain. That is a uh, brand market and <coughs> develop. We try to make faster in AI uh, edge. We need faster and smarter and more effective. That is uh, our concept for global enlightenment community. And it is very special for uh, to celebrate 90th birthday of Governor Marco Dukakis. And also we published the book in uh, early December on his birthday, November 3rd. That is the book. Uh, from uh, the matter to set miracle to the edge of global enlightenment. So we welcome, invite all of us here today to <clears throat> contribute for the book, special book. Yeah. So I will send you more later. Thank you. And uh, now, uh, John, John and uh, and Tom is a great <coughs> figures in new concept as uh, David mentioned. So they have great. Uh, I also I attend great uh, discussion and meetings uh, in the MIT Media Lab uh, on uh, uh, March 6 and 7, and a uh, wonderful meeting for staff. So now, John and Tom, please, John first. <clears throat> You're on mute. Thank you for having us. Um, and it's a very, very interesting discussion here. And, and it reminds me um, uh, back when I was first working at the Berkman Center, I'm no longer there, I'm, I'm more affiliated with MIT. Um, and we were working with the concept of, of privacy and the issue with, the, with Facebook was coming on and there was a lot of activity around Facebook. And our concern was that people weren't getting control over their personal data. And I had previously been in the um, Carter administration and worked in NTIA information policy and privacy even before it was a big issue. And so it was it was a concern to a lot of us back then. This is like 2004 um, about how to protect people uh, uh, and protect personal information. And Cam's very aware of this. And I had worked eventually with Sandy uh, coming over from Harvard to MIT to look how to get control of people and personal information. The point that I'm trying to make here is that even back then, it was very difficult. We knew something was going to happen, but you had a business model that incentivized companies made a lot of money on being able to appropriate uh, people's private uh, information. Um, and it was very difficult to enforce. And, and I think 
the lesson that we've learned, at least I, I, I learned on this, is that this notion of privacy by design is that you really have to look at designing systems, new technologies that inherently by design do not create these negative externalities. Um, and that it's not something you can impose. And then the other side of it is, is that when you have very powerful business models, it's extremely rewarding to do this. It's very difficult to enforce. Um, and uh, so that you have the lobbying efforts, you have the effort. And so we had worked in the GDPR with Sandy and I, and then Cam, and we were well, very familiar with these efforts to, 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 to address privacy issues, which really still have not been addressed. So the technology in a lot of ways is there to do it and do data sharing. Uh, it's very difficult to implement the regulatory frameworks to do that and keep up with the technology. These are points that are made earlier. Um, and so I think Tom and I, we go way back. Um, we were talking about the early companies in AI. Uh, it was really great to reconnect with them. Some of the first companies he had in Telecore, I had a company called Brattle Research. Um, and over the years, I think we've earned to see a, a new version of uh, artificial intelligence coming out that, that is, and I'll let Tom go into more detail, but because he's developed a product around this that is really human centered, is biologically centered, that has the ability to make explicit the assumptions and the models underlying. It's not just a set of correlations of multi-billion dollar, multi-billion parameters, but actually you can, uh, ways of verifying claims and creating provenances of claims made in, in the AI. This is extremely important. Um, so I think that, that what we're seeing is an opportunity to uh, develop a new categories of, of design principles that in July the AI, and we have the, I think, the science and the technology to do that. And we got together to form a group of companies, sort of collective intelligence uh, for a common good, in which we would make the technology uh, an open source. We'd pull our patents and pull technology in such a framework that it could not be captured, that it would abide by certain principles. Um, and I, I think that the and so in that sense, I'm very encouraged that there is an alternative to the opaqueness uh, and the centrality of these large language models. And, I, and I'll, I'll let's go on that. But I also, they, they, with CrowdSmart, what they've done, and it's, it's very important, uh, they have a process by which they can engage people together to be able to arrive at not just a consensus, but a common understanding, a shared model of what a outcome might be. And then that, from our vantage, from the kind of work that we're doing, you can design a, an entity that, that actually does that, that actually is designed by intent and purpose that reduces the uncertainty about being able to create that kind of outcome. It's very explicit. It's science-based. It's almost like codification of a scientific method. So I think there is an alternative way of thinking about this that it creates a new kind of technology that itself embedded in, in, in this embedded these principles. And I'll, I'll leave it at that and, let, and then maybe hand it off to Tom and, and he can talk about his perspective in this. But it's, it's, it was really great to reconnect with him on this and see that we're in parallel paths after all these years. Well, thank you. Thank you, John. And it is a real privilege to be here. I, I appreciate the opportunity. and. Uh, as we were, uh, you know, started off with uh, Nakayama-san uh, about 40 years ago, I um, was coming to Japan with an AI message with a Professor Fred, uh, Ed Feigenbaum and the expert system, remember the fifth generation project. And so back in 1983, 1984, we were giving large presentations on this new world of AI around expert systems. And one of the things that was wonderful about that is we were codifying the knowledge of human experience into <clears throat> rules. And, 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 and of course, it was hard to do by hand encoding that. But one thing we knew, where the knowledge came from. And one of the problems with uh, chat GPT and second generation AI is we've lost data provenance. Where did the data come from? Is it true or not? We don't have that ability in the second generation technology that, that you're now seeing with chat GPT-3 and 4. They do not link to data provenance. And this for the first time in information technology history, we have failed 
to say, where did it come from? That has the potential for significant wrongdoing. And I'll give an illustration. My son is a, a computer science major at McGill University and interested in linguistics. And very technical detail around phonetics. ChatGPT <clears throat> gave a wrong answer with great conviction. But it was a wrong answer. It even quoted his textbook. But it was wrong. And the point is, is that if we don't know exactly where the data comes from, we can never know if it's true or not. So I just want everyone to hold on to that because I think uh, when this when ChatGPT first came out, I said this could be the potentially create a new AI winner. I lived through one <laughs> previously, so I think we need to proceed with caution. And I proceed it with everyone is uh, talking about that here, but there is hope. And one of the individuals is very much a participant in the uh, Boston Global Forum, Judea Pearl, is part of that hope. Judea Pearl stated that you are smarter than your data. We, as a human, as humans, we are smarter than our data. If you want to look at it, is uh, uh, you know these large language models are pulling oh. together some of our past successes and some of our past mistakes without paying attention to which is in which category. And they'll generate things that look smart, but they may not be smart. And so what Judea Pearl points out is the only way is for us to tap in to human imagination and what he called causal reasoning. The second major shift, and by the way, we started down the path about eight years ago of creating a new framework for AI based on Judea Pearl's work, because he too is older guy like John and I, <laughs> uh, has seen the world of expert systems move into Bayesian belief networks. And it was a brilliant, brilliant contribution, I think, probably understated, because it is what he's done is created a framework around which we can look at our shared beliefs, our shared convictions, our shared opinions. And that's very powerful. And that, frankly, what John alluded to, this new uh, center or a place we wish to create is to make that possible so we can bring, create causal models of what we think will be the solution to many important human problems. The second part of that is work that was done around modeling artificial intelligence around the principles of living physics. And I happen to come to AI out of applied physics, using free energy principles to do things in magnetics. Well, it just turns out that a lot of that same mathematics applies to how the brain works and how deep learning works, actually. And so what we're looking at now is the possibility, and we have created early forms of that where you can literally create AI systems that have their roots in natural principles, in natural laws of physics. Um, why is that more trustworthy? Well, it's been around a little bit longer. It's not a heuristic. It's something that's fundamentally and has the sense of balance and ecosystem built into it. And this is the work that John and his group is doing and looking at how do we create that sense of balance and ecosystems in the new organizations that we form. It's very important. We don't need to have organizations that don't adapt. We need organizations that do adapt. But I want to cut to some simple examples uh, because uh, we, we are we call this process of humans and machines reasoning together. And in our system, we literally have chat GPT is just like another being sharing ideas with humans. And the humans can decide whether it's good or not, whether it's uh, accurate or not, but we need to have humans in the last mile of any use of artificial intelligence, particularly the current generation, which is prone to error. Uh, so one of the calls here is a process of what we call collective reasoning, where humans reason together, think together, share ideas together, strip the identity out for now. And when they share with ideas with each other, let's take away, let's only look at their ideas, not their identity, because it's that way we can find common ground. And here's one way we're a couple of practical projects. We are currently working with a project in the city of Cincinnati 
to reduce gun violence using this process of collective reasoning, where the voice of gang members, and by the way, I've been through two of these sessions now, you know what, they don't want to be locked in that situation. They're respectful, they're looking for a way out. No, they, I mean, this is something I think we have to realize. No one in a bad situation wants to be there. And so we're allowing them to reason together, have their ideas heard together with former police chiefs, with academics who've looked at inner city uh, economic issues and violence, and see if together we can find outcomes and solutions that will work. The top idea that came out of this, and this, the system kind of identifies top ideas, is that if we identify solutions within our own neighborhoods, they are the most likely solutions to work. And so quite often we bring in experts to look at problems. Let's listen to people who are in the middle of the problems. The second area where this is being used is within NATO. Um, uh, NATO is looking to how do we, or how can we become more efficient in our decision-making processes, listening to the member nations and being able to listen and respond, things like the Mediterranean dialogue. And it's being pulled into situations like that. The former chief technology officer for the Air Force has seen this as a way that we may even reduce global tension if we just come together, share ideas that will solve rather than, uh, so my point is this, I, I don't wanna go on that, that bandwagon, but I do believe that we have a way forward that encompasses and embraces this idea of humans reasoning together and taking good ideas that may come out of AI systems. And because by the way, they're great at thinking up ideas that we had forgotten about, maybe something that comes and it's very important to have that, but let's do it together. Whereas humans, we are deciding that last mile and we're also making sure, I think one of the biggest calls I would say, if we are going to do anything regulatory is put something back in about the importance of data provenance. Data provenance, understanding where something comes from is really fundamentally important to the, having a foundation of knowledge and truth going forward. You cannot use, if you don't know the data provenance, it cannot can be used in a scientific process. And this is, uh, uh, it's just it's just fundamentally that we have to pay attention to that. And and the dazzle has made us forget that. So anyway, thank you very much for the opportunity. And, and John, you have another thought, I think. I, mean, I, just, I just want to build on something that Tom was saying is, is, is that I think there, there, we can think of the our ways of thinking of AI has been grounded in the concept of machine. And now, and, and what Tom was alluding to is, is the concept of, of physics of living things, biotic AI. And it ties into a lot of work that's done in neuroscience. There's a man, Carl Friston, who's the most mm -hmm. cited neuroscientist in the world, who developed this, these uh, principles of, of, of physics of living things. So you have a principle scientific basis of how to actually create entities that do not create and I mean entities that could be companies, this is where I think the business model becomes really important, that do not generate negative externalities. Because then, then you're building into the system itself, it's self-correcting, it's making itself explicit. Um, and rather than trying to do it after the fact and whack-a-mole. One of the things that they just re-referenced that when I was at, at Berkman Center, I remember a conversation I had with Brad uh, uh, Brad Smith was Microsoft, who was the general counsel then. This was this is 15, 16 years ago, with, and it was in the Harvard Faculty Club. And we're, and they were they were sponsoring work on um, privacy. Well, still it hasn't been solved. I just heard him recently interviewed uh, about uh, their new Bing product, and he was he was he was extolling it and act, treating it as if well, there's just these problems come up. We'll we'll treat each on a use by case by case basis. It's like whack a mole. You can't do that. It really has to be built into the in, into the system itself. You can't, and it you can't do that with the current la large language models because they're they're not they do not have an underlying causal representation. So I'll leave it there. Uh, I saw Ruth. Uh, we really exciting and uh, love your discuss last uh, uh, meeting on uh, February twenty eighth. Now you here. Uh, we would like to invite you.
xe mở từ đấy Yes, good. You hear me? Uh, so maybe Ruth cannot hear. So I think now. I uh, apologize. Uh, I am actually going off to teach um, <laughs> okay, in about five okay. minutes. So I'm going to okay. have to um, dash off. But I, I, I want to endorse very much the call for someone human to be at the end of the um, chain here with this second generation of AI. Let me just say that one of the things that has um, come up since our last session um, was the possibility of um, how we might attach legal liability to AI systems and what that might do for the way it's designed. So to John's point, the reality is that if, if you're not thinking about liability, you will actually um, have all of the incentives to take more risks. Um, and I, I'm not sure it was John or Tom or who said, you know, a big difference in the second generation of AIs is we don't know where the data comes from. And because there's no accountability, um, and no liability, we're in the worst of all possible situations, which means every incentive um, to do bad is in fact on the table. And this is a huge, huge problem. It's a huge risk. Um, it's also the case that um, we now not only have the risk of intentional harm, there is the risk of unintentional harm because as, as my spouse would say, the problem with deception is people who are deceived don't often know that they're deceived. So you're, you're feeding and repeating and passing on information that um, may in fact um, be quite problematic and you may not know. So the intent um, lever that we use in law um, may do no work for us um, in the absence of regulation, because you you had no intention to to uh, you know facilitate misinformation, you just it was the information that was available. So that leads to what people often mischaracterize as a trade off between innovation and regulation. I think this is a false trade off. I hope over the course of the rest of our discussion today, you you engage in this um, conversation. But I, I just want to say up front that I think this is a highly problematic way of framing the debate about AI and tends to feed into the malaise and the lack of engagement at the policy level to think about appropriate frameworks for regulation. Um, not every innovation is in fact good. Um, and, and the idea that for fear of stifling innovation, we ought not regulate, um, I think should be a non-starter from the get-go. Um, this is dangerous. Um, um, the un, unaudited and unsourced and unregulated data um, combines, I think, the worst of all of our fears. And um, um, the regulatory framework should range, in my view, not only from how we incentivize the development of AI, but built into that incentive system should be the liability design metrics and the risk design metrics, um, as well as disclosure, so that you have from the get-go innovation unfolding in a way that already builds in and embeds our greatest possibilities for regulation. All right, I'm gonna to run to try to go make some lawyers um, and I will hopefully see many of you again at our next session. Thank you, Tuan. Thank you so much, Ruth. I love you all so much. What wow, ideas. Thank you. See you next time. Yeah, thank And uh, I think now, uh, please, um, uh, Fang Seko. Fang Seko. You are here, Fang Seko. Okay, I think maybe we don't hear for Francisco will later. Maybe Nam Farm, you are here? I, I think Francesco yes, is yes. just activating his oh, active. I hear, but uh, maybe we wait for Francisco. But Nam Farm, yeah, he ready. Sure. So Francisco will after Nam Farm.
Uh, short uh, good morning to, to our friends in the US. Uh, good afternoon to our friends in Europe. Uh, and good evening to our friends in Japan. Uh, uh, just, uh, and thank you for, for having me. Uh, I think uh, Prime Minister Zalasko mentioned earlier that he always uh, have to prepare and uh, he also take a lot of note uh, during the meeting. Uh, I do the same thing. Uh, however, uh, after a, every meeting, uh, after I had a chance to listen to you, I have to throw away most of my notes uh, because I learned so much uh, from the, the, present, the presentation. And so therefore I have to uh, adjust what I have in my mind. Uh, I'd uh, like to echo uh, some of the thoughts uh, that uh, our previous uh, speakers uh, have touched upon. Uh, first, uh, I think uh, uh, Professor Patterson in his uh, opening remark, uh, he reminds us of our uh, social contract for the AI age. Uh, I think that's the, the foundation uh, framework for what we do, for whatever we do uh, moving uh, forward. Uh, I also love the idea that uh, Tom just mentioned uh, about the human uh, at the end of uh, the process, but I, uh, I like the idea to have human at every step of the process. Uh, everything we do uh, have to uh, keep uh, the human's uh, uh, enjoyment or suffering uh, regarding whatever innovation uh, or process, technology process we may have. So I think uh, humanism is the also the foundation of, uh, of what we do. Uh, I also love the idea of uh, uh, having uh, the UN uh, Asia Pacific headquarters in Japan. Uh, we always uh, talk about accountability, transparency. I think that's one of the uh, values that we uh, cherish. Uh, however, I think uh, uh, regarding account accountability, uh, Japan uh, is, uh, in, is on a higher level uh, than any other countries. Uh, in Boston area, if we take the, tea, the train, if we lay for an hour to a two hour because of the train not running on time, nobody uh, would say anything or lose the job. But I remember two years ago, there was a train conductor in Tokyo. Uh, he resigned because his train came in one minute earlier, one minute earlier than schedule and he resigned. Uh, I think that's, <laughs> uh, that's a very, very high sense of accountability. Uh, and uh, so the idea of uh, having uh, an international body in Japan uh, uh, to embrace the uh, concept of uh, accountability and love, AI means love in Japanese, uh, I think is very good uh, combination. Uh, Prime Minister Zalatko also mentioned about an alliances of, of uh, liberal Democrats. Uh, I think we also have to keep in mind uh, a very dangerous uh, of another alliance uh, is the alliance of the tyrants. Uh, I think we need to uh, strengthen uh, the alliance of Democrats uh, to, uh, to counter the alliance in, uh, of uh, tyrants, uh, which I think uh, many of us uh, have alluded to, China, Russia. Uh, China has taken full advantages of AI technology uh, not to serve the Chinese people, but to control, to repress, and to oppress the Chinese people, and who knows what else. Uh, so I think whatever we do, we have to be very vigilant uh, of the idea of we have to be make sure or do whatever we can to minimize uh, the damage uh, of the uh, of those uh, tyrants. And regarding regulation, uh, I think. Uh, uh, the UN has uh, a declaration that most countries uh, have embraced uh, the, uh, the, the declarations of human rights. Uh, I think if we can move forward, maybe we should uh, set a goal to have an international, global, or UN declaration of uh, human, uh, I'm sorry, of uh, AI uh, principles to serve people. Uh, if we I can get many nations to uh, embrace our social contract for the AI age, the framework 
uh, the concept uh, uh, we set out in there, uh, I believe, uh, uh, is a very good uh, foundation for recreation or whatever we do uh, to ensure that the humans is the central theme uh, of AI. Uh, that's all I had. Uh, thank you so much. Thanh Nam, uh, wonderful con, uh, uh, talks and discuss, and thank you very much. You always a uh, great uh, support and good. And uh, now, Francisco, uh, yes, please. Can you, can you hear me? Uh, very clearly, good. Okay, good. So it's always a pleasure to see you people. It's, uh, this is a, becoming a wonderful uh, kind of community. Uh, to exchange views, no? also because I, I feel that uh, uh, we are kind of creating a collective uh, uh, shared uh, uh, understanding. And um, so it's because of that uh, confidence in this group uh, that I'm going to take uh, an unusual position, uh, which is not my uh, official position, right? Uh, I rarely take that. But I think because uh, uh, I don't want to overlap with all the many things that you've said and I agree, uh, with right, so uh, this, uh, the reason for this premise is because I'm I'm going to play the evil advocate one second uh, here, uh, and it's a I think it's important that we understand the scale of uh, of uh, this transformation, uh, and um, and it's very important that we uh, don't indulge into uh, kind of hegemonic uh, critical narratives that are emerging because I feel that. Uh, um, uh, there is a kind of consensus uh, of critique uh, towards these uh, systems that is emerging. Um, and the, while I've been part of that uh, kind of uh, uh, impetus for the past 15 years, you know, uh, I also have to use some cautionary words to, to explain a few things. So let me give you an example. I, I think it's a total misunderstanding uh, when uh, people talk about the issue of accountability of, let's say, child GPT, right? And, uh, and the lack of references to uh, the uh, knowledge that is used to produce the responses. And the count of consequences that should be for the kind of responses that are produced. Well, let me, let me point it in, in a different way. Uh, first of all, there's dangers in both scenarios. So the fact that uh, ChatGPT and the like uh, don't have uh, specific references to where the knowledge is being generated from has positive and negative consequences. They are not all negative. So why? Because I think, it, first of all, it needs to be understood what ChatGPT is. Uh, if you take it as uh, something that produced uh, scientific knowledge that needs to be part of uh, scientific discovery. So part of a discourse, specific kind of discourse uh, that we might call a scientific discourse. Then I understand why there is the expectations of uh, understanding what are the resources that have been used to generate the response. But imagine that you're thinking of chat GBT in a totally different way. And instead of calling ChatGPT, which is a terrible name, by the way, you call it Maria, right? And Maria is a, is a dear friend, is in the room, and she's an incredibly unique person in the world. She has an incredible capacity. She has this really incredible knowledge. And she's providing her opinion about something you asked. Now, it's incredibly important, especially that us as academics, don't pretend that the scientific discovery is such a reliable system to reference. The fact that we have to understand that chat GDP is not to be taken as the word of truth and that it needs to be truthful every time is incredibly important. It's like when you do scientific research, you always hear many different voices and your judgment, it needs to be built never on one resource only. So if you take chat GPT for what it is with all its limitation and you understand how to use it, so not as the Bible of truth, but as Maria that has an opinion, 
and you interact with that opinion is a this you know know it all person that you meet and she's always incredibly smart she's incredibly knowledgeable but whenever you have to make decisions one you take responsibility of what you say and you don't delegate to maria the responsibility of what you say so you you have to respond to the opinions that are provided in the correct way you don't have to look at it as the resolution of a scientific uh, uh, concluded analysis of a topic. So I don't know why the expectation for these systems is to be always correct. I don't know where you can, how you can push so far as to say they have to be liable uh, for what they say, because that would be true for books in the same way. So uh, anybody that's published a book and someone that is using that book for some resources, should the, the person that has published the book be liable for the use that someone else has done of that information, either at literum or in, the, in a different context? So I understand what I'm saying. I profoundly believe that AI needs to be regulated. I think that the consequences of what this uh, uh, immediate evolution is going to be for humanity is going to be immense but i think that it's also really important we that we uh, keep a balanced view of of these uh, systems first of all there's not going to be only one chat gpt uh, there's cactus ai there's going to be many that are coming to to the fore each one is going to perform in a different way so there's going to be a plurality and there's going to be a certain level of competition as in any other media there's going to be market dominance but there's also going to be alternatives there's already alternative ai systems that are designed for academics with references so everything it, that they respond as specific references even the sections that are taken from the text are referenced directly to documents that you can click and open so i i think that the we need to be able to go beyond the one single application, which is ChatGPT, that is uh, fascinating everybody right now, and to understand the plurality of what is coming, and the fact that uh, these many systems might have different responsibilities. Because uh, if you ask to a friend about an opinion about a medical condition, there's a certain responsibility of your friend. If you ask to a doctor in an official context, there is a different responsibility. So context is important. So you cannot flat line say the chat GDP is responsible because what is the context? What kind of information and knowledge is providing? What context is that system uh, describing itself to be in? It's really important to have any form of regulation. So it needs to be more complex and, and people have to start to be a little bit more analytical in understanding and going beyond the fascination of one AI system, because we're entering in a competition of AI systems. There's going to be different criteria for the performance of different AI systems, depending on context. If you use ChatGPT in the context of a med medical consultation, there should be liability, there should be responsibility of who's using that information and for what. But if I'm just simply asking something in the context of I want you to know a recipe, or what not, people should take their own responsibility and the ability and critical thinking of looking at the source of information. We constantly make decisions in our life based on incomplete and incorrect information. This is being human. This is what it is. We, we take many tidbits of information. Most of them might be wrong to make an opinion. So I understand because of how powerful it is because of the power it is, there is needs for for uh, for uh, kind of accountability, but it's also very important that the people that talk about regulation they do it in a complex, articulated way, and that they just don't indulge in this uh, hegemonic critique, uh, because to me it seems that it's flatlining on a number of uh, of articulations that is repetitive, and is putting it out of context. Now, this was to play the evil advocate. Now, if I can uh, conclude, because I don't want to take too, too much time, I'm right now in New York. Uh, I've participated for the last two days to the 
Global Futures uh, uh, Forum uh, that is part of this uh, UN initiative on the Pact for the Future. I don't know how many of you know about that. And I've been in this room with uh, I mean, incredibly powerful people from all parts of the world engaging in so many uh, different environments. And I've been reminded of how much of a first world problem is what ChatGPT uh, and the like are going to be. Because uh, when we talk about changing jobs, when we talk about the consequences for economy and whatnot, uh, I'm sure that you understand with me that the, the digital gap also means that the consequences of these systems, the paradox is going to be that are going to be felt more by the societies that are fully are uh, integrated in these systems, where there's infrastructure that allows those systems to be very powerful. But there's also many, many people around the world that actually don't even, uh, even have internet access and, and for whom that system might actually be an advantage in fundamental ways when comparing it in relative terms to other societies. So there's an incredible level of complexity. Uh, it's very important to have many voices. It's very important to have uh, a strategic mode of operation where there's a people that are constantly almost like the GFK model. You need to have an evil advocate in the room that takes the, the, the opposite position just for the sake of uh, uh, dialogical reflection. And I think we have a responsibility as intellectuals and as people that are putting forward the uh, policies and whatnot to fully understand the complexity of the problem and not just to rely on hegemonic critique uh, because uh, uh, I think it's not really helpful. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Francisco. I think now, uh, James, James, raise your hand. Want to talk uh, or discuss, James? Please uh, unmute. Please unmute. James. Hello. Can, yeah. uh, can you hear me? Great. Yes. It's really terrific. It's wonderful to see everybody. I was. <clears throat> I um. The, the November twenty eighth meeting we had in Boston was terrific. Thank you, Tuan. Thank you, everybody involved. Um, it was a great way to go into the holidays, and I I find this to be a, a wonderful community. Um, off the shoulders, by the way, Francisco, you, what you, I appreciated the, the, the breadth of what you just covered. Um, I think there's a lot of merit there. Off the shoulders of kind of a John Ruth uh, and, and Tom touched on, you know, in, in, in the development of this, and there's ways to pull it from building off the shoulders of the accuracy, truth verification um, in, its, in its coding seems to be much, you know, a hope, hope that could be um, harnessed, you know, if, if, if reward-based. I mean, the thing is, we're in a time also of such stability. I'm on the board of the News Literacy Project, which deals with media literacy, right? Uh, um, um, and, and, and we have a pandemic of disinformation coinciding with the, with with this new, with this new development. So, um, I believe you know everyone's entitled to the right of, to, to their opinion. I don't think everyone's entitled to their own facts. And so, ha having now the programming built on the shoulders of rewards from 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 validity. So you know, was Thomas Jefferson, Tom, Alexander Hamilton did X, Y, and Z, and then. That's course, it's reaches, and that's that's verified, and then those truths make that much more of a predominant, you know, uh, uh, you get where I'm going with this. Anyway, I just wanted to throw that in. Um, exciting, fascinating, now I want to say hi. Hey. So, um, so Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I think uh, now Simon, Simon, please, uh, uh, Simon, raise a hand. So, uh, please. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Francesco, very wonderful um, thoughts, uh, always, as always. Uh, I do want to make a couple of counterpoints to what you mentioned. First of all, I have a question about uh, how do you mean uh, hegemonic? Is it AI versus human or is it hegemonic between democratic uh, countries and the others? So the political divide. Um, and then I have a couple of other points. One is accountability issue is very complex, as we all uh, agree. And you, um, 
uh, you gave the example of books. Books under, undergo, one, they are a physical product. Second, uh, they, are, they undergo a lot of scrutiny that AI doesn't, what goes into AI. And I totally agree with you. ChatGPT it is just one little speck in an ocean of what's, what AI is going to uh, is going to have in terms of tools and uh, so on. Uh, so um, my concern about what AI produces is the fact that the users, consumers, are not just going to be academics or well-informed uh, people, but the average and what, how it influence individual beliefs and behaviors. That's uh, another point. And then um, uh, finally, yes, of course, account, we can't hold AI or technology accountable. We have to hold creators and users and um, those who set policies and implementation of policies around them accountable. So we are the creators, the humans, and human um, uh, entities, entities made of human beings, every organized around you. So those are, those are some of the thoughts that, that came to my mind I would share with you and everybody uh, in response to what, what you mentioned. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Who else? want to raise a hand and to discuss before I conclude it. I conclude, yeah. Who else want to talk on more and discuss more? I, I can, can I make just one quick comment? And it's also a way to say goodbye because I have an appointment at 11 and, 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 and I'm running a little bit late, no? Uh, I think it's important uh, to understand the, uh, the ways in which, for example, uh, these generative AI systems will affect social relations, no? And it's important to understand that one thing is if we're talking about scientific discovery. Uh, another, I understand the, the, the argument for facts, right? That, the, that there's a, a necessity for truth. I would say that in many ways, um, uh, these systems can be a cure for many of the problems uh, uh, that we have about, uh, you know, misinformation and disinformation, because a, a solid, accountable uh, system uh, can actually counter fake news. In any case. It can, uh, of course, you can say that it can generate it, but if you have a re reputable source like a BBC uh, GPT, uh, for example, you know, something that has uh, the credibility because the data are provided in some way, there can be a cure actually for disinformation and misinformation. Uh, many states will uh, obscure uh, systems that provide uh, uh, truth that they don't like. But uh, one thing that I want to point out it is that human relations are rarely based on truth. And uh, the truth, uh, it's not necessarily the key criteria in human relations. Um, religion, uh, then we should go after everybody that believes uh, uh, in something they cannot prove. Uh, so try to argue uh, against religions as, a, uh, as a, a construction of truth that has been inspiring uh, humanity for, for millennia. Uh, I mean, you have a fundamental problem uh, if you believe that everything in human relations is based on, on truth. Uh, human interactions are very many times not based on achieving effect. Uh, it's the interaction itself that sometimes is the function of human relations. So my fear is that uh, these systems will intervene in spheres of humanity uh, where truth uh, is not necessarily the uh, necessary outcome. <clears throat> in personal relations, uh, if you're in a partnership with your daughter, with your uh, offsprings, with your partner, many times the conversation is not about the fact, but the consequences perceived individually and differently from each person of those facts and the perception can be different. So there is no fact in always as a key function in human interactions. So it's very important to be nuanced. It's very important to be nuanced because ultimately AI are challenging what it means to be human, it is changing and reshaping our idea of what it means to be human. So it's very important 
not just to indulge in the most prepared critique and being able to see how the intersection of many things will be affected. But this is wonderful always to, to chat. I'm so sorry that I have to go. Uh, I wish I could stay, but I'm sure there's going to be more occasions. And um, I'm looking forward to meet again. Thank you to and for organizing this. Thank you for contributing, Tom and, and everybody. My dear friends, now I feel like uh, I know most of you and I'm looking forward to meeting you again. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Francisco. Uh, uh, James, uh, James, uh, very interested from New York. And, um, and also special thank our speakers, discussion wonderful today. After we have great uh, section and uh, meeting on February 28th now, but I think very much a progress and uh, we uh, have milestone to Tokyo April 5th, rather, and uh, that is the April 4 in uh, Boston High uh, evening. And uh, <clears throat> so we are very important <clears throat> event that in person at Harvard Faculty Club 26th of April. <clears throat> and uh, I talked with you, uh, I mentioned already about global enlightenment community and global enlightenment mountain. That is, uh, we try to make a very uh, pioneering model for ZTI and uh, the age of AI and digital by new new concept, new model. We move faster and to make a, a very milestone to celebrate uh, Governor Michael Dukakis and I, on his birthday and uh, Nike birthday. And uh, we uh, continue this cut on the email and uh, sometimes in person and sometimes in group, small group, and <clears throat> feel free to discuss more and to make uh, very, very significant impact to government. We send some, that is the report to European Commission and uh, some government and very good, very, very good uh, feedback from them. And uh, we hope we will have uh, final version and a great recommendation and also excellent plan for our ideas. And thank you so much for uh, a <clears throat> new concept from John, from Tom, and also David, and uh, Boston Global Forum, very uh, respect, and uh, we join together and support this concept to reach out in our global enlightenment community. And uh, one Again, thank uh, James. James, yep, you can actively contribute more in your ideas. You send directly email to me, and not only technical, also in community. You can uh, set up and join with us to uh, develop community in New York, <clears throat> in your high, your high. I think um, there are a lot of things to do in uh, for to make the world better and uh, to. Uh, make the age of global enlightenment and uh, contribute for the United Nations Central New York Initiative. And uh, thank very much, my lovely friend, and uh, thank you again for Ken Kerry, yes, uh, great uh, opening uh, keynote speaker for today. And uh, your speech, valuable, very, very valuable. And we continue to enjoy and work more. And uh, I hope you will great global enlightenment leader for our work in uh, the mission. Thank you so much. And thank uh, a San. And uh, we prepare special report, special uh, initiative for Japan to contribute for Japan and also it make Japan great again in Zithai. And uh, I, I hope you will and uh, your leaders, uh, Japanese leaders will great uh, receive and a very exciting receive our special report initiative in Tokyo and Zithai. Thank you so much and say best regard and love to Japan, to your leaders, the government leaders, Japan leaders. Thank for your co cooperation and support together each other. Thank you so much, Sam. Uh, that's who that's Sam, as always. Thank you so much, my dear friend. Thank, see you next section and also see you online email and uh, thank yeah bye bye, -bye.